But today, we're very pleased to have Dr. Raj Mori from Duke. Um, he leads a psychiatric neuroimaging lab there, focused on brain changes associated with post-traumatic stress disorder, traumatic brain injury, and other neuropsychiatric disorders. He uses several advanced methods for understanding brain function, including functional MRI, structural MRI, diffusion tensor imaging, and genetic effects. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to okay. Raj for today's brain map. Thanks. Good, uh, good afternoon, and um, thanks for inviting me, and thanks, David, for um, helping arrange this. I thought, I thought we'd have a lot more interesting uh, characters uh, today, being Halloween, but I think at least we, I, we brought Justice Ginsburg out of retirement, so that's good to see. Don't joke about that. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Ho hopefully, at least, at least uh, till we get a new president. Um, so, I'm going to talk about some of the psychological sequelae from exposure to physical, social, and moral threats, and some of the ways we've uh, explored that with uh, structural and functional neuroimaging. Um, and I have no disclosures or conflicts of interest. <laughs> Um, so just a very broad outline of my talk, I'm going to first start with um, some of the um, psychological hazards focusing on PTSD, uh, which is really stems from this exposure to um, some kind of threat of your physical integrity uh, or safety. And then I'll go on to what we call moral transgressions, which lead to shame and guilt, uh, which is now in the in the scientific literature is called moral injury, and also um, likewise with, with social hazards. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go on. So um, uh, the PTSD model is really, um, has evolved over the last couple decades um, based on this understanding of, of threat and fear learning. And so, um, learning what's threatening in the environment and what's safe is really um, critical to survival and it's highly conserved um, both behaviorally and biologically. Um, and fear learning paradigms have been used for um, trying to understand PTSD. So that's things like fear conditioning, fear extinction, um, fear renewal. And so those have been used really in both animal models and human models to understand PTSD. Um, and of course, one of the key structures in understanding fear processing or threat processing is the amygdala and the various amygdala complexes, which I'll be talking about. And um, also other circuitry that is closely interacts with the amygdala um, that's involved in you know, consolidation of memory, uh, fear generalization, uh, extinction retention and renewal and so forth. And some of the structures are sensory cortices, the thalamus, um, the hippocampus, and the ventral medial prefrontal cortex. So um, I, as I mentioned, um, you know, fear conditioning is, is one of the basic models and here in, shown in, 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 uh, in rodents, uh, if you pair a, a uh, innocuous stimulus like a sound with a aversive stimulus um, you'll get this from the aversive, aversive stimulus or the unconditioned stimulus you'll get this uh, this freezing behavior or fear behavior fear response um, and if you do this pairing um, this a couple times you'll eventually get this conditioned stimulus to elicit the same behavior which is freezing and um, then if you continue to present this uh, tone after several trials, you'll eventually get an extinction response. So you'll, the freezing will disappear. And so this is uh, you know, an important uh, uh, paradigm for doing uh, fear conditioning. So um, as I mentioned, the amygdala is, is crucial in this and we wanted to try to understand am amygdala structure and uh, so we were interested in amyg amygdala volume in PTSD. When we started uh, looking at this, there were really um, a few studies that looked at amygdala volume. Um, however, there were really um, only 
uh, and most of these results were in, in very small sample sizes and also um, most of them were um, actually negative um, or there were a few with uh, that were trend level significant and then there was there's this one study that's has a you know really small sample size um, one thing I wanted to note here is that the, the effect sizes for these relatively small samples were pretty high. So here you have effect sizes of uh, point, I can't read that very well, but uh, 0.62 there and 0.4. And then uh, with this only study that was significant, uh, an effect size of um, 0.8. And um, I'll come back to that a little bit later because um, I think that's really important for what we've been, what's been now in the popular or in the scientific discourse about reproducibility and replicability. So, um, as we started this work, we looked at uh, what's been what's known in terms of amygdala structure and how the amygdala responds to stress. Um, so, this is work done by Shona Chatterjee, uh, but you know, replicated in, in other ways. Um, so this is looking at unstressed animals, uh, animals one day after acute stress and 10 days after acute stress. So on the y-axis you have the number of spines um, and on the um, uh, x-axis you have this um, basically a measure of the branching. And you can see that um, the unstressed animals have this uh, is a blue line and then you have a little bit of increase. Um, with this one day of acute stress, but uh, a very significant uh, response in the sp uh, number of spines after 10 days. So, and this is in the basal lateral amygdala, so you're getting this hypertrophy, and coincident with that hypertrophy is this behavioral response where the unstressed animals don't exhibit very much of the anxiety uh, behavior, but then even after one day of stress, you get some anxiety-like behavior, and then after 10 days after the acute stress, uh, which is uh, actually a, a restraint type of stress, you get a very marked um, anxiety-like behavior. So you have this anxiety behavior and you have this uh, hypertrophy, or at least this increased spine density, which... So you're doing the same number of dead rates have more spines, or are there more dead rates? Um, so I think it's... Um, so it's like spine as well. Um, yeah, so... I, well, th I, let me go over this slide and then maybe it'll be a little bit, because th th this has a nice picture of it. So this is, um, it's thought to be initiated by this, uh, the severe stress triggering this corticosterone release and corticosterone uh, leads to a reduction in um, uh, GABA uh, and GABA is an inhibitory, synap is inhibitory to the synaptic inputs for the basal lateral amygdala cells. So yeah, you can see here um, the dendrites um, are are showing that there's dendritic growth and uh, increased uh, spines too. Does that take so, so more dendrites? Yeah, more dendrites and more spines. Yeah, so especially uh, visible in this like more chronic repeated stress model. Um, so we thought that maybe this could help you know inform our um, our research on in humans, and um, maybe we could see um, some consistent findings in um, in humans with PTSD and well with trauma exposure in general. Um, so this is where in our first study we had uh, a little over 200 subjects, and uh, we also in addition to measuring P you know assessing PTSD, we had other measures of depression, combat exposure. Uh, traumatic life events, uh, alcohol use, the duration of the PTSD, and then um, and depressive medications and antipsychotic antipsychotic medications, uh, which are used sometimes in PTSD, especially severe PTSD. Um, and so these are our uh, main results. Um, so with the uh, free surfer segmentation, we found significantly smaller volume um, in, in PTSD than in controls. So that was not what we might have predicted just from that animal work with the basal lateral amygdala. And we saw um, significant in the right and even more significant in the left uh, amygdala. Uh, 
And um, again, I'm gonna just, uh, yeah, so that was, that was our main result for the amygdala. Um, and we replicated this hippocampal result, which had been uh, reported quite a bit in the, in the literature. Um, and we also looked at some, some of the other uh, uh, things that we adjusted for, so combat uh, exposure, uh, traumatic life events, uh, duration of PTSD, uh, depression, um, and um, actually none of them really had much of an effect. There's some trend level things in there, but none of them really seemed to have much of an effect. Um, our effect sizes were definitely smaller than the ones that we saw uh, that were reported in these really small sample sizes. So on the left hemisphere, we had an effect size of 0.28, and on the right, an effect size of 0.39. Um, so definitely smaller. Um, sorry, yep. less exposure. So um, we did, so there were, there were um, being a, a military group, there was blast exposure, but we did uh, control for it statistically. I didn't, I, it's not in the slide, um, but yeah, we did control for that. Um, and um, so, yeah, I'm just, I guess I'm just going back to this, um, this effect size. <laughs> Uh, here of 0.88 and 0.64, which was quite a bit larger than what we had. Um, we also wanted to um, think about trauma exposure um, because trauma exposure is a stress even if you don't get PTSD. Um, and as is the case with all our samples, um, you know, the PTSD sample usually almost always has more trauma exposure than the control group. So what we, we sampled uh, a subgroup of our 200 subjects. So we had, uh, we, where we matched for trauma exposure, both combat exposure and trauma life events. And we had a resilient group, we called it of 46 and a PTSD group of uh, 76 that was matched for trauma exposure. And we again found that the PTSD group had smaller um, amygdala volume and we did this for a number of reasons. We wanted to look at um, first, make sure that if there were any nonlinear effects related to um, trauma exposure. We also know, as I mentioned, that trauma exposure is very much collinear with PTSD. So, uh, with that kind of statistically, we know if we use a covariate for for trauma exposure, that that you know, that variance doesn't always get partitioned in a neat, in a clean way. So we wanted to look at that uh, for that reason. And then we also wanted to look at the, the effect here because from the animal models, we saw that this increased stress creates this um, increased spines and also dendrites and uh, hypertrophy. Um, so we were still, um, you know, Thinking, thinking that this this uh, finding may be, you know, we were still questioning our finding, and uh, at this time we were also taking note of all these uh, findings. A lot of them, uh, these papers published by John Ioannidis at Stanford, that talk about um, the the need for replication. Uh, I think this is one of his most cited papers. Why most published research findings are false, and uh, this other paper, why replication has more scientific value than original discovery. And um, I think he ends the abstract with, um, yeah, I can't read that actually, but uh, it's, it's the idea is really that original discovery actually, he's, he says or thinks that original discovery leads um, science on these, you know, dead ends or, um, you know, and, and, and a lot of that, a lot of times they're not, they, they don't hold up to be true and the replication is really how science is advanced. So um, one of my other roles is that I lead the Enigma PTSD consortium. And so we, um, as part of this effort, we um, looked at subcortical volumes in uh, a sample of uh, 1,841 subjects. We had 780 with uh, PTSD and 1,061 controls. And um, our hippocampal finding was 
pretty robust. And in, in other words, it was it was significant even after correcting for the number of comparisons we did, which was the eight subcortical volumes. The amygdala finding was nominally significant at p equals 0.025, but it wasn't. It was did not um, stay significant if you corrected for multiple comparisons. Um, so, uh, and in fact, uh, getting back to the issue of effect size, um, the effect size here for this uh, amygdala finding was just 0.11. So, as um, you know, INEDs and others have pointed out that the, uh, you know, the, as you, as you do these studies with larger samples, you, you sometimes get effects that disappear. So at this point, we were still um, kind of wondering uh, a few things. We'd found uh, actually no correlation of amygdala volume with trauma exposure, which is one thing that we had kind of predicted. Um, and so we were thinking, is it possible that there may be smaller amygdala volume that may be a vulnerability to PTSD, and that's what's explaining this smaller amygdala volume? Um, and this was, you know, in the setting, as I mentioned, that animal literature, at least in the basal lateral amygdala, amygdala suggests that there's an increase in volume. Um, and is, or is it possible that the two effects of this increasing volume and this pre-existing vulnerability are maybe somehow canceling each other out? Um, so our, our next approach was to actually look at the subregions of the amygdala, uh, which would hopefully allow us to, to look at a phase lateral amygdala volume. Um, we're also gonna explore uh, trauma unexposed uh, subjects. Um, so we, we um, started with looking at using resting state functional MR and um, uh, it, it, to look at this. Um, and I'll get to that in, in the next slide, but um, I just wanna go over a little bit about the basic, um, the basic complexes or nuclei in the in the amygdala as they relate to fear processing, um, and I'll just yeah. So the basic circuit uh, relate, relating to fear conditioning is you know mostly been worked out in animals, um, and it's really the basal lateral amygdala that's um, it, that's uh, involved in this associative fear learning. So when I showed the image of the tone and the, the shock, that learning that association or that pairing is really what's, um, it, it happens in the basal lateral amygdala and um, as well as the, the fear learning and the extinction uh, and the consolidation. Whereas the expression of uh, the fear is uh, associated with the central nucleus. So these are the um, behavioral expressions of fear, um, like freezing and, uh, and uh, flight and so forth. Um, we actually, in, in humans, um, the expression of fear is, is definitely somewhat different than animals, but I'll get into that a little bit later. Um, so in this, um, we did this functional MR study, we had uh, 20 PTSD subjects, 22 uh, trauma exposed, subjects and we used uh, an approach similar to uh, Amy Roy published this in, in uh, 2009 but um, using this uh, atlas um, we basically define uh, voxels related to basal lateral amygdala, amygdala which is circled in red and the central medial amygdala which is circled in, in orange and again basal lateral associated with fear learning and um, the, the central medial associated with fear expression. Um, and so this is in the top panel uh, is the controls and the lower panel is the PTSD. And what we see actually is the, that, um, well, the, the central medial connectivity, so the central medial seed connectivity is in red and the basal lateral connectivity with the basal lateral seed is in blue. So you can see by and large that the central medial shows functional connectivity with subcortical regions, a um, lot of striatum, and the um, basal lateral shows connectivity with a lot of cortical regions, and that's um, 
sort of makes makes sense since the basal lateral is associated with fear learning and the um, central medial is associated with fear expression. And we did see differences uh, in the PTSD relative to the control group, which are um, shown in these uh, direct contrasts where we had more functional connectivity um, with the basal lateral amygdala in the PTSD group in these uh, frontal, me medial frontal areas, the um, pregenual anterior cingulate and the dorsal medial prefrontal cortex, um, as, and also the dorsal mm -hmm. anterior cingulate. On the other hand, we had, we had more basal lateral amygdala connectivity uh, in the control group than the PTSD group uh, in the left inferior frontal gyrus. Um, and the left and the inferior frontal gyrus is, as many of you may be aware, is um, strongly implicated in in control, cognitive control of, of emotional information. So this was um, uh, actually very much was um, in line with our with our predictions and what we know knew from the literature. Um, so um, yeah, so I'll just summarize that the resting state connectivity with uh, BLA and with basal lateral and central medial could be biasing how the amygdala complex differentially modulates processes and target regions that govern behavior, cognition, and affect and PTSD. And the differences in the resting state connectivity of the basal lateral amygdala with various cortical regions may be biasing the normal modulation of connectivity between these structures um, during task engagement, such as um, associative uh, fear learning. And then final implication is that um, the potentiated connectivity of the basal lateral amygdala with the default mode regions, such as the dorsal medial prefrontal cortex that are strongly associated with self-referential thoughts could be mediating elevated anxiety and PTSD during rest. That is in the absence of these goal-directed um, cognitive activities. Um, <clears throat> so from here, we went to um, looking further at the amygdala and trying to uh, look at the volumetric um, uh, evidence from, from the amygdala and um, using the new release of FreeSurfer 6.0, um, which I maybe need, don't need to go into um, um, any background here, I guess, uh, but you know, built on this um, ex vivo segmentation of the 710 Tesla scans in 10, 10 post-mortem brains um, acquired at 100 micron resolution um, to produce this kind of atlas of uh, nine amygdala subregions um, or nuclei. So the medial nucleus, the corticoamygdaloid transition area, uh, accessory basal nucleus, um, basal nucleus, um, central nucleus, cortical nucleus, anterior amygdala area, lateral nucleus, um, and the paralaminar nucleus. Um, and so this study is um, not yet published, but um, we did this in 372 um, veterans, um, recent veterans, Iraq, Iran, Iraq and Afghanistan veterans. Um, so around 38 year Late 30s is the mean age. So we had 156 with PTSD and 216 controls. Uh, and in our uh, model, we, uh, well, yeah, we controlled for whole amygdala volume, um, age, alcohol, drug use, combat exposure, childhood trauma, depression, gender, and psych psychotropic med use, and also um, looked at PTSD by childhood trauma interactions. Um, so this is just more uh, information, specific information about the, the sample, which I can come back to it if there's questions. Um, so, um, yeah, so we found, um, actually, um, even with the FDR, correct. So these, uh, this, this, uh, third from the last column is the, the uncorrected P values and then the FDR. Um, corrected p values. So we found significant effects in the accessory basal nucleus um, and the medial 
uh, nucleus and the cortical nucleus, and then sort of a trend level FGR corrected in the central nucleus. So those are all regions that are, you know, that we would have expected or hypothesized um, that we would find differences because, um, as I mentioned, excess the basal complex, basal lateral complex is involved in fear learning and the central medial and fear expression. Um, and um, so we, we had, um, but we had actually divergent direction of findings. So in the accessory basal, we had uh, control greater than PTSD. I don't put much stock in this. Um, this was a very, very trivial effect size. Um, but we did find in the medial nucleus, we see um, greater PTSD, greater volume in PTSD than controls. Um, and um, those are um, very significant with the FDR correction. And that's in the left amygdala. In the right amygdala, um, we have uh, very, well, mostly consistent with the, with, the, with the left side. So the lateral nucleus, the accessory basal nucleus, uh, central nucleus, medial, uh, and cortical, and paralaminar. So again, findings that are consistent with these two complexes, the basal lateral and the central medial. Um, here again, we see um, different patterns in terms of PTSD versus control. So um, again, this effect size is, is really small, um, but in the accessory basal, uh, greater volume in the PTSD, same thing with the central, medial, and cortical. And then in the paralaminar, we have this opposite, um, this opposite finding. Um, and again, uh, relatively small effect sizes, and I'll talk about that a, a little bit in, in a minute. Um, we again, we looked again at combat exposure because we, you know, as I mentioned, combat exposure is very collinear with our grouping PTSD group. The PTSD group tends to have a lot more combat exposure than the non-PTSD group. But when we look at um, this, this was one of our most significant findings was the left medial, medial nucleus. And uh, on the y-axis, look at that in relation to combat exposure. Um, and you look at the PTSD group, which is the orange dots, and the uh, non-PTSD group, which is the blue dots, there really is no difference in the relationship um, between the two groups. So um, that was actually reassuring. Um, and um, as I mentioned, uh, this, this collinearity of trauma exposure we also get this similar collinearity with childhood um, uh, trauma, psychiatric meds, substance use, alcohol use, and depression. They're all seem to be more common in the PTSD groups. But when we did this, looked at all these interactions, there really, and did a correction, there really wasn't anything that was significant um, in that. Um, this is looking at the, um, I'm just looking at how much time we have. Okay, um, so this was looking at, um, we, we, we went back and forth about whether we should correct for whole amygdala volume or we should correct for intracranial volume. And um, this is uh, trying to sort of inform that decision. Um, here, this is on the, on the x-axis, the left medial volume the, of the medial nucleus. And on the y-axis is, um, the orange dots are the, um, the intracranial volume, and the blue dots are the uh, whole amygdala volume. So you see the correlation of the nucleus with the whole amygdala volume is much stronger. R squared is 0.2, uh, whereas the correlation of the medial nucleus with, um, um, with, with the intracranial volume is, is there is a, a, a much weaker correlation. I've, I've um, played around with the Y axis here so I can get all the dots on the same uh, axis, but these two are, are, I did a 600 X for the, um, for the whole amygdala volume so I could get it on there. So we, in, in the analysis, we ended up um, controlling for whole amygdala volume and not for intracranial volume um, because we thought that whole amygdala volume um, um, 
explains uh, more of the, the variance uh, associated with, um, or accounts for more of the variance. Um, I think it's actually answering two different questions, whether you uh, account, if you co-vary for whole amygdala volume versus uh, intracranial volume, but that's a, a longer uh, debate. So some of the limitations of this was that, um, of course, it's a veteran population may not um, generalize to other types of PTSD. Um, this is, next two bullets are right from the Free Surfer web, web page, uh, which is that these internal boundaries between nuclei uh, of, of the amygdala rely, rely on um, prior knowledge acquired from this, uh, this atlas. And so um, that could be driving um, a lot of it, especially when we have these three Tesla one by one by one scans. Um, and then, yeah, so the volumes of the nuclei should be interpreted with caution. Um, so one concern I had based on those two uh, cautionary notes was that maybe there's this, with this heavy reliance on priors might lead to, um, you know, smaller than expected variants in the sample or our subsamples in the PTSD group or the control group. And this might lead to a more sensitive uh, test statistic. But um, when we did um, permutations, several thousand permutations of group assignment, we really still got about the 5% expected um, rate of significance in these randomly permuted groups. So I think we were able to, I, I had that concern and I was able to address that. Um, so I think I kind of went through the um, conclusions as we were talking about this, which is that we, you know, we found um, differences in, um, in sub amygdala subregion volume in some of the, the regions that we expected, but the direction wasn't um, necessarily, um, didn't really necessarily make a lot of sense to me. Uh, in the future, we're really gonna, um, what we wanna do is look more, at, drill down in the data and look at um, re-experiencing symptoms, which are really more related to this associated fear learning, because re-experiencing is really, um, where you have these frequent reminders of, of the trauma, well, where you have frequent um, thoughts and uh, of the trauma uh, based on cues in your environment. Um, and so that's more related to uh, this fear learning kind of process. Um, and then also look at um, avoidance symptoms. Um, which I don't, yeah, so avoidance symptoms in relation to the central amino acid. And avoidance symptoms are, at least we think of, uh, more, more like fear expression because they're um, really just this kind of behavior where you avoid um, places or people that might remind you of the trauma. So I'm going to switch gears to this uh, idea of moral injury. Um, so moral injury refers to these shame and guilt-based disturbances. They are, seem to be very common, especially in this recent, and maybe they, it's just because they're being studied more, but seem to be very common in this recent uh, group of Iraq and Afghanistan veterans um, who have violated, who in the course of their military service find that they violated deeply held moral or ethical beliefs and expectations. Um, but they don't, these, these kinds of events don't qualify as trauma, which is, um, you know, some kind of threat to your physical integrity or safety. So they don't really qualify as PTSD. Um, so, and um, a lot of these kinds of um, moral transgressions, we call them, are related to, you know, harming civilians or seeing other soldiers harm civilians or not, or maybe harming children or other kinds of things that are very much a part of uh, war. Um, but, you know, we don't, they would, they would generally not happen in, in everyday life. Um, so, and they are uh, very strongly associated with guilt and shame, uh, which are thought to be key mechanisms of moral injury. Um, but they're also very strongly correlated with PTSD. Um, and uh, so this is just some pilot data from our, uh, from a collaborator at, at uh, the Durham VA, 
which uh, shows a significant percentage of veterans reporting that they did something morally wrong. Um, they fail to prevent acts even uh, of morally wrong things, even when they're possible, and they or they've witnessed morally wrong things. So we wanted to look a little bit more about um, the neural sort of basis of this of moral injury and see whether these neural correlates can be are dissociable uh, between moral injury and PTSD, and that maybe this knowledge could help advance um, our understanding of PTSD of uh, combat veterans and also treatment. Um, and so we looked at three diff. Well, we looked at a couple different uh, approaches. We did. Um, we looked at. This is very much a preliminary data uh, with resting state fMRI. We looked at uh, amplitude of low frequency fluctuations, uh, which is a common approach to determine the intensity of spontaneous uh, fluctuations in resting fMRI. And then we also looked at functional connectivity, which uh, I'm guessing most of you are familiar with. So. Um, and we looked at, so basically, um, correlated activity between seed areas and, um, and uh, other brain regions. Um, I'm gonna just uh, skip this slide just because of time, but um, this, um, so the, the, the way that we measure moral injury is this moral injury event scale. It uh, actually has two components to it, one is uh, perceived transgressions by self or others, and the other is um, perceived betrayals by others. Um, this betrayal thing sounded kind of weird to me when I first learned about this, but um, it seems to be a big thing in, um, well, it's, it's best illustrated in, the, um, in when you think about more, uh, military sexual trauma. Um, as you guys might know, you know, women are about 20% of the military force, and so they're, um, it's not unusual for women to be, you know, subjected to all kinds of things ranging from assault to even, you know, more milder harassment. Um, but this betrayal comes in quite a bit, which is really betrayal that um, their commanding officer maybe should have investigated this kind of military sexual trauma, but didn't. Um, that. They were let down by their superiors, by their fellow soldiers, by their country, and those kind of things. And then PTSD, of course, we measure with the, the CAPS, um, which is a well-established <laughs> instrument. And we looked at, we used um, multiple regression to look at uh, uh, neural correlates uh, uh, of, in, of whole brain activity when, and regressing out some of the expected Compound. So this is, uh, you guys might not be able to read this in the back, but um, this is sort of the questionnaire that we use, the moral injury event scale. So some of the questions on here, I'll just read them. I saw things that were morally wrong. I'm troubled um, by having witnessed others' immoral acts. I acted in ways that violated my moral, own moral code, and so on and so forth. And then there's other questions. There's other um, questions about betrayal. I feel betrayed by my fellow service members. I feel betrayed by others outside the US military who I once trusted and so forth. I trusted my leaders and fellow service members to always live up to their core values. So, um, so some of the questions that we were interested in, um, you know, what are the differences in neural systems associated with betrayal and transgression? What are the differences um, between um, transgression and PTSD? Uh, and also, um, yes, and, and, and the same for betrayal. So um, our main result, one of our main results are that we did um, see using this um, amplitude of low frequency fluctuations, we saw that in the left inferior parietal lobe, um, we see this nice dissociation between the transgression subscale of the moral injury and the betrayal subscale of moral injury. So the red showing um, a positive association with this score and the blue showing a negative association with this score. Um, so that we thought that was um, uh, actually very, very interesting. And, um, uh, but this, again, this is a small sample of only 26 subjects. Um, and then we also looked at um, 
whole brain seed-based functional connectivity. And so we used the, the, the inferior parietal lobe. We used this inferior parietal uh, region as a seed and, um, oops, and um, found that the precuneus um, actually, that the CAPS, uh, which is the PTSD scale, was um, positively correlated with uh, functional connectivity. Um, and the uh, moral injury scale was negatively correlated with, fun with functional connectivity in the precuneus. Um, and of course, you know, the precuneus is, uh, you know, widely discussed in relation to self-referential processing as and, and um, part of the default mode network. So just to conclude this part that, um, you know, moral transgressions and betrayal, uh, two forms of moral injury seem to be dissociable. Uh, with patterns of resting fMRI. Uh, moral injury and PTSD should seem to be dissociable uh, with functional connectivity using the left inferior parietal lobe and the precuneus, or between the left inferior, inferior parietal lobe and the precuneus. And hopefully this knowledge will help with um, customizing treatments in a more sort of precision medicine kind of way, whether it's um, through psychotherapy or through uh, brain stimulation. Um, since both PTSD and, and moral injury are, are highly comorbid um, in, in veterans and military personnel. Um, so with that, I'll just thank um, the people in my lab and also my collaborators and uh, open it up for questions.